which is critical, creative, ambitious and engaging writing on contemporary literature and culture. So what can you tell us about the history of the journal? When did it start? So the journal was founded in 2013 uh, by my colleagues at the Writing and Society Research Centre at Western Sydney University. Uh, that was under the guidance of Anthony Yorman, Ivor Indic, and under the editorship of James Lee, who remains an important part of the journal now. The journal was founded um, on the back of widespread discussions about critical culture in, in Australia and about the diminution of spaces for serious reflection on new works, particularly of Australian literature, but of, on transnational literary culture more broadly. Um, and I would have to say, since the founding of the journal in 2013, there's been a really sharp decline in space for thinking about, about literature. It's, it's space for thinking about culture more broadly, but very specifically for thinking about literature. Um, I feel very lucky to be able to do the work that I'm doing and to work with amazing critics from around the country to, um, to develop serious, detailed, lengthy responses to new works um, that are emerging. Uh, it's painful though to see uh, how little there is, or that the spaces for that are diminishing, diminishing elsewhere. There are some, uh, there are wonderful critics, there's wonderful criticism being published, but I do really firmly believe that we need, we need more of it and that one long review in the Sydney Review of Books is not enough for, for, for any book. Um, so I was talking about the foundation of the journal and I got sidetracked into polemic mode uh, in the minute, minute five, which isn't necessarily a, a great start. So I was appointed to the journal in uh, to edit, to the editorship in mid-2015. Um, in that time, uh, the ambit of the journal has expanded somewhat. We now publish series of uh, literary essays on assorted themes. The particular themes that we've emphasised over the last few years have been essays on place, um, our series on, on nature writing, which always requires some kind of scare quotes around the word nature, um, our Writers at Work series, and more recently we've been commissioning new work on domesticity um, and on technology and the fruits of that commissioning will start to uh, appear on the site next year. Oh, interesting. Excellent. So you mentioned that you started there in 2015. What led you into the role as editor? Um, all many, many different paths. Um, I'm a lifelong uh, enthusiastic reader. I did a PhD in English at Sydney Uni in uh, a while ago, <laughs> in the, in the mid-aughts, um, and worked, like so many people do, as a, a casual academic for many years and thinking about whether or not I wanted to pursue a research career or not. I got sidetracked working in digital media um, in that period and really became very excited by the pace of publishing online. I love I love working online. I love how flexible and responsive uh, it's possible to be, not to mention the small overheads. So I had I spent a lot of time with um, a site called New Matilda, which has changed dramatically since I worked there around 2008 to 2012. And that was a real apprenticeship in managing online publishing cycles and budgets and thinking about how to fund online organisations and keep them, keep them afloat. Um, and it provided me with a really rich understanding of, uh, of online publishing. The landscape has changed a lot since then. Um, I also did a stint at the Conversation website as their arts editor, um, which was a much bigger undertaking. And I learned a lot from the um, ambition of that site and the, 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 the breadth of audience engagement there in particular. Um, but through all that period, I kept a very close engagement with literary culture um, as a reader and as a critic myself. And when the job emerged at the Sydney Review of Books, it really spoke to me and I was a very enthusiastic applicant and absolutely thrilled to get the job. And I still absolutely 
you know, I feel very lucky to have, have the role that I do. Excellent, excellent. You mentioned about the journal being online and the advantages that it gives it. And unlike most of Australia's other major journals, uh, Sydney Review Books started online. And I wanted to ask what effect do you think this has had on the journal's ability to operate in that space? And <laughs> what advantages it provides? You mentioned a few already. And um, if there are any disadvantages? Uh, well, I think if we launched as a print journal, we wouldn't exist now. Mm. Uh, so that's a pretty substantial advantage out of the blocks. Look, I mean, it's the, the structure of the organisation means that all funding we receive can be paid out to contributors. That's given the support that we receive in terms of uh, salaries from Western Sydney University. So there's a very direct um, flow of public funding uh, from funding agencies to writers. Um, that's allowed us to make compelling funding applications. Um, this is not too you know, not too exciting, I realise. Um, it also allows us a far greater potential audience. Um, and we've been seeing really steady audience growth over the last five years with much, much more growth um, this year. Of course, it's really exciting when a piece goes viral and, you know, you see the big spikes in the chart. Um, but, uh, what is more gratifying is seeing um, is seeing steady expansion of our audience in Australia and overseas, and I think that would be very very difficult to achieve with print distribution only. Mm. We've also benefited, I think, from changes in attitudes to digital publishing. Um, even five years ago, I know there was some scepticism among parts of our readership about the bona fides of online publishing. I would receive people emails from very, uh, very astute critics asking if they could write for our blog. And I think the baggage of um, slapdash online editing standards uh, were still uh, making itself, well, we're still weighing us down. Um, and I think there's just been such an absolute transformation in the way readers of all ages and all inclinations um, use screen culture and interact with screens that whereas once there was a sort of perception that we weren't very serious about what we were doing, um, that, that has really changed uh, a lot uh, in, in the last five years. Oh. And we did do a reader survey at the end of 2015 when I asked about, well, be, before a website upgrade, and, um, the, you know, we were talking to the developer about what questions we should ask. And one of them was like, how do you read the Sydney Review of Books? And the question was obviously to like find out whether people used an iP iPad or their phone or their desktop or their laptop. And that would affect some of the design choices. And I was like, oh, maybe we should put print in because, you know, people do tell me that they print things out. Say, oh no, come on, come on, you're a website. No one's going to print out the website. But in that survey group, or something like 15% of the people who responded said that they printed out pages from the SMB. Um, when we did a survey more recently, the figures <laughs> changed quite a lot. Um, right, interesting. So you've almost gotten to sort of chart that change in internet culture more broadly through through those surveys. That's really interesting. Yeah, look, I think I think our audience is much, much more comfortable with thinking of, uh, conceiving of a, um, an online literary journal. And, you know, we, we have other journals, you know, leading the way there as well. Right, yes. And you mentioned um, that it's exciting to see when pieces go viral. Do, is there a recent piece that you can, that you, that went viral that you can <laughs> tell us about? <laughs> um, I've always find it very hard to bring up recent examples because my head is so full of our program. Look, if pieces get picked up by a major US aggregator, then we get tens of thousands of people swooping on the site very, very, very quickly. Um, and that's very exciting. Um, I tend to think, you know, it's a nice sugary adrenaline shot when a piece goes viral, um, but it doesn't really tell you much about what people think of the site. It's much more important to me that we build a kind of steady audience of people who keep 
keep coming back. And there are certain things I know that boost virality, <laughs> boost like really kind of quick uptake. And, you know, if you want to provoke people or have a like a broadside about a particular policy moment, those things get kind of taken up, but they are, you know, sort of a bit like fairy floss, invective goes viral. Uh, often um, disclosure goes viral. I think it's misleading to, you know, to read too much into those kinds of big traffic spikes um, is misleading. And uh, overall, I think my view is that my, my attitude to programming and the SRB is not to pay too much attention to our traffic statistics and certainly not to be guided by that. Now, were we, were we to be guided by <clears throat> um, traffic, we would, the SRB would look really, really different. Right, right, of course. So in thinking about actually how you do make your decisions in terms of, in terms of what you do publish, can, do you know roughly the breakdown of criticism essays and other features on the SRB? Would you? Well, I should do that, but I don't. Um, and I don't. Uh, I would say probably 75% of what we publish uh, are long form review essays. Um, and some of those are highly experimental works. And, you know, I think they, the, you know, they, they merit kind of reading as literary works in their own right. And I often make the case for uh, the review essay as, a, as an important, important genre, rather than thinking of the review as a kind of um, independent or parasitic genre. Right, okay. And did you want to comment on, so I've mentioned criticism essays, but you do other features such as interviews. Um, did you want to comment on, on other things that appear on the site as well? Yeah, look, we're always thinking about new forms of content that we might add to our program. Um, I really, I feel strongly that review essays need to remain at the centre of our program. Certainly, I receive many more unsolicited approaches from writers to write general essays rather than review essays on literature. I think our identity and our reputation really hangs on those review essays. And that's really what will continue to, to dominate our program over the years ahead. And those essays provide, I think, a kind of context for the other essays that appear. Interesting. We are in the process of developing a podcast, um, or at least a pilot of a podcast. And so we'll have some audio um, on the site next year. Okay. So, and any insights into the podcast? What's it, what it, its angle is? Um, no, well, it doesn't really have an angle. That's, that's its angle. I mean, we've been thinking and talking a lot about how we might develop a podcast, um, and really not being certain about the right format for us is what has held us back. There's plenty of interesting cultural audio cultural podcasts out there and we wanted how we might fit into the space so we're developing a pilot that does that explores a few different formats and we'll be very interested to hear what our readership makes of them and we'll also be reflecting on you know how difficult it was to make some of them right as we, as we contemplate our next steps you mentioned in terms of the essay topics you you had your series on place uh, which included Vanessa Berry's award-winning essay, um, Nature Writing, Writers at Work. And you, you said for next year, you'll be, uh, have some focus on domesticity and technology. So how do you, how do you choose those topics? And what, what leads you to, to select certain topics? Um, look, these are all really, really broad topics. They're deliberately and vexingly broad topics. Um, we have tried to keep these streams as a reference point for our essay commissioning so we don't wind up as a kind of repository of a whole lot of random material and what I've really enjoyed seeing over the years that we've been commissioning for example our place essays is relationships between those essays form and the emergence of a body of writing that in which different writers work can be read 
um, with and against each other. And that goes even more so, I think, for those nature writing essays, which we continue to add to that, that, that series or that stream. Um, and uh, readers who are motivated or interested can, can read back. We know there are lots of people who, who follow these series and who you know, understand that the essays are making sense of each other, that there's relationships between them. Um, one of the things that I have wanted to do in these series is also give writers as much latitude as possible so that we're not, um, we're not giving them a template to write to. And um, I know lots of people have, have responded to me when I've asked them, do you want to write an essay on place? I mean, like, what kind of an essay on place? And the idea has been to make a space for people to develop their practice, to develop work that they might not otherwise have a platform to develop, to, um, to build on their practice and interests rather than to write to a restrictive, restrictive brief. Um, so we've been, we've been adding to these series and expanding them somewhat. I can't say that there's like a, a, a very um, formal process for deciding the themes and were the subject of discussion, editorial discussion um, in house about the kind of work that we'd like to see and the kinds of topics that we felt um, could be well explored, but um, really they're broad so that people have space to work, to work within them. Excellent, all right. So I think that sort of leads me into actually um, maybe how do you see the relationship between writer and editor and what makes that relationship work best in your opinion? Um, well, look, I wonder whether you get the same, uh, <laughs> same answers from people that I, I, whose work I've edited. Um, I, it's a relationship that works best when it's based on trust. Um, I've had such rich, rich and varied relationships with SRB contributors, some of whom are emerging writers, some of whom are very established writers. Um, and I work very differently with, with writers. It depends very much on what a particular writer's needs and preferences are. Um, there are some SRB contributors who send me work that is pretty much complete and I go, oh gee whiz, there's a comma missing here or something, or make a few small comments and there's a very limited editorial interaction and I admire the work and publish it. Um, with most writers, there's a much more hands-on process and sometimes very, very intensive. Um, we've developed practices for working with emerging writers that are, you know, ask a lot in terms of trust from emerging writers, particularly those who've never worked with us before, um, where we work with people really from early drafts and uh, provide lots and lots and lots of feedback at the early stages of drafting a piece of criticism or an essay. And that can often go through several stages of, of rewriting and redrafting before we get to a kind of copy edit stage at the end. Um, it's really thrilling to sit with an author and to see their work take shape over, over what can be several months. And I'm always really grateful to writers who are willing to um, interact with all of my rambling comments on the side and my misedits when I, you know, fail to add the missing commas or whatever it is. Um, it's, it's for me a really, a really rich process. Right, wow. We, I found it really interesting when you said that, um, particularly with emerging writers, that, you know, you, you ask a lot in terms of trust. Um, how, do you, how do you do that at, like at the start when you know you're working with an emerging writer how do you set up that relationship? Um, so with our Emerging Critics Fellowships, which have now been running since 2016, you know, we have, we work, we, the people who receive those fellowships write um, three essays each for us, usually over the course of a, a year. Um, and that the, 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 the process of delivering those fellowships has refined considerably um, since 2016. 
Um, usually my preference would be to start with a face-to-face -face meeting or a Zoom. That seemed weirder last year, but now of course we just meet by Zoom. Um, to talk generally about process and to talk about the work at hand and to try and establish a rapport and some kind of common, common points that we want to work on. Um, I'm not interested in moulding um, emerging critics into the SRB's ideal critic. I'm very interested in working with emerging writers to you know, to do the best work that they can and to do work that is a real, um, that reflects their interests, the work in which you can hear their voice. Um, so those first conversations are important for me to understand the writer and their artistic and intellectual and political interests, for me to think about whether other editors uh, are going to need to be brought into the process for me to think about whether I know enough about the topics that they want to write about to bring in other readers in the process. That's something else I should mention is um, increasingly a standard part of our process. If we feel that we don't have enough knowledge to edit a certain piece, um, I'll often ask other readers to, to come in during the course of the process. So there's as much attention and as many questions asked of a piece of writing before publication rather than after publication. Right, right. Excellent. So then what makes a successful piece of criticism in your opinion and what makes it really memorable or stand out and maybe <laughs> you could give us an example or two from this year? Um, I've worked hard to avoid a uh, SRB house style or template form of criticism. Um, which is maddening to some contributors who'd like closer reference points and style reference points to work from. Um, and yeah, look, I, as I said earlier, think of the critical essay as a literary form in its own right. So the voice of the critic is very important to me, the quality of the writing, the consistency of the writing, is very important to me. Uh, a critical essay is also an intellectual engagement with a piece of writing, though not always. So I want to bracket off the possibility that it might not be intellectual, an intellectual engagement first. Um, so the structure of the essay is always very important, the structure of the argument, the ways in which ideas um, flow, support each other, sustain each other. Uh, the depth of knowledge that is brought to an essay is important. The way in which that knowledge uh, is carried is significant. Um, but for me, what is what what an essay stands or falls on is the quality of the reading and the way in which it can be said that a critical reading emerges from the text at hand and the way in which the critic uses the text uh, to substantiate their reading. Um, I do think critics should make space to consider what it is uh, an author is trying to do. But mm. I do think that critics need to take a stand. I, th I think critics need to take a stand and deliver evaluations of the works that they're reading. Um, and that those evaluations need to be substantiated. Now there's calls for substantiation that are much louder when the evaluations are negative. Mm. But I would like to see, in fact, a lot more substantiation of why critics think books are absolutely wonderful and brilliant. And I do lots and lots of work with critics who are making negative evaluations to, you know, out of a ethical obligation to the author uh, to find out why it is those evaluations are being made. But I also find myself often uh, working closely with authors to nut out just why it is they're delivering really hyperbolic assessments of a particular, a particular work. Um, so thinking about essays that we've published this year, I mean, it's very hard for me to pick standout pieces because I'm so involved with so many of them. Right. Um, you know, some that, some that spring to mind um, are very, that show the range of essays that, the range of possibilities for the critical essay. Um, one is of course, Melinda Harvey's absolutely extraordinary essay about Rachel Cusk's outline trilogy and the more recent essay collection, Coventry, 
and the essay's title, Verisimilitude. It's a highly experimental piece in the mode of Rachel Cusk. Um, it's a long piece. And when I say that it's really, really close to the text in how it, um, in its considerations, uh, its proximity takes the form of, of emulation. It's the result of deep reading and deep listening to the rhythms of Cusk's prose. Um, another piece that I really loved this year um, was Sheila Pham's essay on Vivian Pham's uh, The Coconut Children. Um, it's, it's a kind of braided essay that is a reflection on growing up on in Cabramatta in the 90s and is a reading of the coconut children and it has reportage I guess as well on um, on Sheila's interactions with Vivian. It's a it's a great essay it's a really critical essay it has a few uh, questions to ask of the transition from the first draft of the novel into its um, published form with Alan and Unwin but it's such a vital piece of writing because it's a, it's a piece of criticism that could only have been written by Sheila. And there's a real personality and specificity to the writing that I think is, um, is fantastic. And it, 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 it's a, a great exhibit uh, against any argument, if anybody's still making it, about a kind of faceless critical objectivity. Um, I also, I loved Mindy Gill's essay on Miranda Rewa's uh, recent novel, which um, is a good, is a good essay in many lights because it's, it's, it's a, it's a survey piece of writing. It provides a really rigorous context for reading an important new novel and it situates that just so deftly within the context of, um, of her broader work. Uh, it was a very polarising essay when we published it, but James Lee's essay on Rebecca Giggs's Fathoms, uh, I think stands as, as an important work of criticism. Um, and it's a work of, it was a negative evaluation of a text that um, has been really acclaimed elsewhere. Mm. Um, and, you know, there you would see a good examples of textual support for the views of a particular critic. Uh, look, I could go on. Um, what, I, what I think is important here is this notion that, uh, that the critical essay can take many, many different forms. Right, right. And it sounds like there's space in there for forms that you haven't seen yet that might be surprising to you yeah, might, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's that's really interesting to think about. I think I mean, you could look to uh, the five-part critical conversation on the work of Mark Fisher, curated by Anwen Crawford, that we published early this year, which uh, definitely pushed a few boundaries in terms of what's possible under the rubric of the critical essay. Right. Oh, excellent. Um, I know our. Writing as well as team is pulling up links to the essays that you're mentioning, so hopefully they'll grab that one as well. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you said um, it's maddening to some contributors that you know this this essentially this freedom that they have uh, when when writing uh, for the SRB, and that they you know some ask for closer reference points because it feels like within that uh, you know within your your um, library of work that any, any writer, any critic could go in and find models that would speak to them. And is that what you advise people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, if, if people aren't familiar with our archive, I mean, the first thing that I suggest they do is to, to browse the archive. Um, I'm interested in our contributors as, as writers. I'm interested in their critical practice as a literary practice. Um, right, right. Um, I, well, we were talking about criticism and I, I, I wondered if you had any different thoughts on, on essays, um, if there were any particular essays that, that stood out to you or, or innovations that you've seen in the essay form that have surprised you or, um, or any just thoughts in general on, on essays as distinct from criticism. Um, well, I think the critical essay is a kind of subset of, subgenre of, of the essay. 
Um, and the essay, the literary essay is an exciting form at the moment and has really been in the ascendant in the last 10 years. And I think part of that is for the really prosaic reason that it's easy to publish essay length work online and to distribute it and to read it over the course of a commute or a coffee, uh, that there's something very um, synchronous about the essay. And I'm thinking of those, you know, um, headers on the medium essays uh, saying, you know, estimated time to read, you know, before you arrive at Paramount Station. Um, uh, uh, there's something very of, of the moment about about the essay. Um, I, what I like about the essay is that it is often a provisional form. It's short enough for people to do, people working with us at the SRB to, to take risks. And in a very risk averse publishing environment, I think that's incredibly important. Um, it's exciting always to see when um, writers have developed work for the SRB or for other journals and then go on to be offered um, the opportunity to do that work at book length. Um, but at the moment, as I said, you know, publishers are not, are, not, are not taking a lot of gambles on writers doing new things. And what's exciting to me about working in the essay form is the space that it affords for people to do work that they wouldn't otherwise do and to push their writing and their thinking into, into new spaces. And I, you know, I love, you know, I love pushing people to do things uh, that are a little bit out of their comfort zone. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's important to the vitality of our literary culture that we have spaces where people can take risks and that those risks don't have to be, you know, instrumentalized and monetized that, that, that that the taking of the risk itself is valued um, and no risk is worth the leap if it may not result in some kind of failure or some slight disappointment. I don't want to suggest some kind of idiotic model where people take risks and there every single risk involves amazing work. I mean the spirit of experimentation and risk must involve um, you know some failures and I, I think I think I'd love to. I'd love to see our literary culture embrace a bit more of that. So, anyway, roundabout. I'm I'm excited by essays. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So then that leads me to ask you um, what you look for in a pitch specifically, and if you have advice for people who are perhaps looking to pitch or have pitched unsuccessfully in the past. Yeah. So right now, my advice is don't pitch to us because our program for 2020 is full and we'll start to be thinking about essays for 2021 um, in mid, mid to late November. Um, because most of our program is review essays, that's where most of our commissioning lies. And I'm always really, even though we receive lots and lots of proposals for, um, for essays and really exciting, interesting essays, those, those are, I'm able to take far fewer of them on. Um, and the ones that I do tend to take on that are unsolicited are those that fall into these kinds of broad interest areas that we've already marked out. Um, for review essays, what do I want to know? Um, a really clear statement of what it is that you want to write about, if it's one book. Have a look on the website first to see whether we have reviewed the book before putting the time into making a proposal. That's very, very important. Um, we, our priority is new and forthcoming works and we probably, making up this decision, more than half of our program is Australian literature. I think at the moment probably 60-70% of the reviews that we're publishing are of new works of Australian literature um, and I don't see that changing in the new year. Um, so what I want in a pitch is firstly um, making a case for the book briefly but more importantly the angle that you'd like to take, the, what you, the, 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 the angle of the review. Um, and that goes to also making a case for why it should be you writing this review. Um, I often get 
pictures that sound like great essays, but there's no sense of a relationship between the essay and someone wanting to focus on, you know, uh, detours in auto fiction or other topics and the, the person at hand. And that the, this notion that you should make a case for you to write the essay doesn't mean regurgitating your whole CV and it doesn't, it's not necessarily a call for um, credentialed only need apply. I mean, the case for writing this essay might be a particular um, affinity for the works of Natalia Ginsburg. It might be um, identity and a shared identity with the author. It might be the fruits of having done postgraduate research in a particular area. Like there might be things that I don't know <laughs> that, or it might be having written lots and lots on these topics already. Like there, there should be something in the pitch to cue us who are thinking about um, what books are under review and who should review them, why it is that it should be you to write this. So you need to kind of make a case for the book, meriting a place in our program and for the, um, for you as a reviewer. We are limited into what we can take on. I'm always really keen to hear from people who want to write for us. And usually I maintain lists both of books that I'm interested in seeing reviewed and of writers that I want to work with. And there are periods during the year where I try and kind of match those, match those together. So um, there's no sense in which if I say to you, thank you, we can't take this on, um, but stay in touch. Like those, I do keep records and lists um, of those things. And there's, uh, please don't be disheartened if we say no. Thank you. That was a, that was a really great, um, clear and detailed response. That was, that was excellent. Uh, so we'll go to audience Q and A in a couple of minutes, but I think just first, before that, we should touch on, uh, the, the funding situation for student review of books. I mean, this is a big topic for all arts organizations right now, right in New South Wales as well. So, but uh, SRB recently had a month long funding drive. So what, what's the funding situation currently and, and um, how is that affecting uh, the SRB? Uh, thanks for asking, Ashley. I'm, I'm really pleased to have the chance to talk about this because I think it's very important to shine a light on how arts organisations work and how arts organisations should work. Um, the SRB is in a relatively strong position, I say with a deep breath, because we have very generous support from Western Sydney University, which means that we have a small paid staff running the journal. Um, that has provided us with um, a strong platform to make external funding applications, um, even at a very competitive time, because all of that external funding goes to paying writers. Um, for me, this is the only way to run the SRB is on a model that involves all staff being paid and all contributors being paid. And it's been very distressing to see that commitment to pay for artists and arts workers falling away as arts funding falls away. Um, we, so we're in a more stable position than many organisations and yet our budget is still under tremendous pressure <laughs> and constant pressure. We had been a four year funded, uh, we had received four year funding from the Australia Council and we were unsuccessful in our bid to have that renewed earlier in the year, which was a huge blow. That's important, important funding. Um, and I have spent vast amounts of time that I would rather have spent um, talking to writers and editing essays and thinking about the literary world. Well, I've been thinking about the literary world, but in the form of writing funding applications. Um, and we are trying to make up that funding shortfall and to make up the funding shortfall by, by gaining new funding rather than cutting our rates or really curtailing our program. Um, we, uh, it has been a condition of every uh, funding feedback that we've received um, that we uh, a stern observation that we don't have a subscription system. When faced with the option of a subscription system, we realised that would 
cut our audience really, really dramatically. Um, so we have we undertook a fundraising campaign in September, and we're really overwhelmed by by the generosity of our of our audience. What that allows us to do will allow us to do is to maintain our program in 2021 at the same level as 2020. Um, I think that's that's the reality for many many arts organisations. It's very distressing to see how little funding there is for literary organisations, how little funding there is for literary journals in particular. Um, and I'm really determined to use the platform that we do have and the, when I say relative stability, again, I just want to start lolling about an unstable way myself, um, to advocate for more funding for our sector and for decent pay for writers and arts workers to be the norm rather than a kind of astounding exception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And, and yeah, Brighton New South Wales is um, experiencing similar issues, which I'm sure our audience is very aware of. So, but you can find more information on our website about that if you're, if you're not aware of it. All right, let's turn to some audience questions. So first one, uh, does uh, Sydney Review Books think of how a digital essay needs to be written versus one to be read for print? So I guess in, in, sort of in terms of the intention of, of the final format. Yeah, look, there are some formatting questions that we consider. I mean, one is no footnotes, and I'm always badgering people to include in-text references and to change footnotes into a works cited list and to hyperlink references in the text. I mean, that's how we that's how we read online, um, laterally rather than up and down. Um, it bears on how we think of the paragraph as a unit. Um, this is more <laughs> frequently a problem for writers who have academic backgrounds, mm. uh, who are used to writing like great chunks of prose. If people come to writing from the, for the SRB from a background um, writing for newspapers and magazines, they don't write like mountain-sized paragraphs. Um, that's that's the that's the that's the main the main issue. Uh, we think about yeah length, space. I think the um, the kind of the breaks in essays that are often pilloried are actually uh, another aspect of you know the the user experience of reading essays online, and they provide you know pauses and places to rest that might be served in a print essay by like reaching the end of a page or something like that. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you. That was uh, Moya's question. So thank you for that. And I mean, someone has asked as well about about the length of the essays, which we really haven't touched on. But what's the average length or, or span for essays? Uh, look, I mean, two and a half thousand to four thousand is usually the bracket that I suggest to writers. Um, often that succeeded. Is there, are there, uh, do you, essays that are significant. I think you mentioned one that was quite long earlier. Do you, or do you occasionally go quite beyond okay, that? So the, the, uh, the piece that Abel Crawford put together on Mark Fisher is like utterly exceptional, exceptional in every regard in that it had six authors and was a three-part uh, essay and ran to 20,000 words. So it needed to, needed to be broken up um, thematically, but that was a very that's a very unusual piece and it's the only piece like that we published this year for sure. Right, all right. A question from Michelle. Could you speak a bit about the experience of anthologizing SRB pieces in the Australian face? Uh, look, it was a pleasure. We're working on another anthology, which you'll hear more about in the, in the new year. Um, the Australian face uh, was published at the end of 20, oh my goodness, I'm struggling to remember, 2018. And it was five years after the establishment of the SRB and it felt like a good moment to take stock of the work that we've been doing on Australian literature and to gather those essays together. Um, just as I think there's something really exciting to me about the non linearity of online publication and the way in which it's possible to suggest relationships between different 
pieces of writing by categorizing them together. And so, for example, like the writers at work essays that we've been publishing, which are much shorter than most of our essays, have kind of taken on a group identity because they've all got the same category tag. And if you click onto that, you can see them. They, they form a group. So the essays stand alone, but they, they form a kind of group statement. Um, that's something that it's, it's easy to do online. It's easy to kind of order things and link across for things and say, this is the first of a series and put the other one there. And they don't have to, you're not kind of bound by time and space in the way that you are with, with print publication. Um, and anthologizing digital essays in print form um, is a different way of asserting those relationships and leaving it to readers to read the essays, not only as standalone pieces of criticism, but to contemplate the connections between them and the relationships between them. Great, thank you. Uh, so you took over from James Lay in 2015, you said, was there a change of focus, style or content when you took over? Um, I guess, you know, like my, my interests are somewhat different to his. I mean, James remains a really, um, vital contributor to the SOV. He's the extraordinary critic and um, I, there's no, to the extent that my, the SRB under my editorship reflects um, different emphases and different interests. Uh, yes, there's a change of direction, but it's one that um, absolutely relies on James's critical vigor and, uh, and insight. And I'm um, very pleased that we are able to work together so harmoniously. Excellent. Uh, and uh, another question here. Is the SRB mainly for academics or for trying, or is it trying for a broader audience? Um, we're for a general audience. So we're for a general audience and we ask them you know, we, we make assumptions about their attention span and their frame of reference. So um, we're not an academic journal, although a lot of academics write for us, you know, in the same, and here references to journals like the, Los An uh, the London Review of Books and the New York Review of Books are germane. We're for a general audience who's interested in reading a 4,000 word essay on Australian literature. <laughs> right, that's a, that's a perfect answer. Um, how does the City Review of Books view pitches from writers who may not have had much published work in an essay or nonfiction format? So I guess basically emerging uh, essay writers. Look, we do a lot of work with emerging writers. I think if writers haven't had some criticism published somewhere or some nonfiction writing experience elsewhere, then, you know, we'd have questions about, you know, what, what you're bringing to the scene of reviewing. And sometimes, you know, we have people who are PhD students who have never had any kind of formal publications who do really astounding work for us. So publication record is not the only thing that we look at when we're thinking about working with writers, but in the absence of a publication record and, you know, a couple of pieces of writing that we can read to gauge um, a writer's style, uh, we'd, we'd look for kind of other, other reasons that compel us to consider, to consider a proposal. Excellent. Um, now, if writers want to get in touch, they, there is an email address on your website, is that that's correct? Yeah, so on the About Us part of our website, you'll find all the contact details. Okay, excellent. Uh, and uh, we've got another question. What will Sydney Review of Books do if they don't get the funding they need? So I guess in, in a we're now we're now reasonably well placed for 2021, and we're well on the way to um, securing most of our program for 2022. So okay. we're um, we will continue <laughs> to have to work to secure funding and to pave the road ahead. But we are. We are confident about our viability. It's working extremely hard supporting Australian literary culture. Um, the, here's an interesting question. Are there any pieces you regret publishing? No. <laughs> I didn't. 
think you were, I would be surprised if you had some off the top of your head that you're like, well, let me tell you about these. Um, this is, this is more of a personal question. You can, you can take your editor hat off for a moment, but uh, are there forthcoming books that you're excited about? Um, so many. I can't, I can't quite see around the question to answer it specifically. I mean, there's, there's uh, such richness in the Australian literary scene. There's great work being done and it's a real privilege to be close to it and to be reading, um, to be reading with critics who are, you know, first and last great, great readers. Um, I think if I start naming books that I'm looking forward to, I'll tie myself in knots and forget the ones that I'm really looking forward to. So I might just slide around that question. Okay. Okay. So then maybe, maybe this question is a little bit simpler. What are you reading at the moment? Um, well, I am, what am I reading at the moment? I've been reading a lot about, food history. So I've been reading a lot of um, Victorian cookbooks, but I'm also reading the books that SRB critics are reviewing. Um, I'm very, uh, very excited about being a judge for the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards this year and chairing the Douglas Stewart panel. So really what I should be saying is I'm reading the entries for that prize, which right. are numerous and there are, there are so many of them. Right. Yeah. So Victorian cookbooks, any, any interesting tidbits from Victorian cookbooks that you can share briefly? Um, look, if you were eating from those cookbooks, you'd be an unhappy person. Well, I mean, the cakes are great, but um, I, uh, yeah, look, they're, they're, they're off a sort of fascinating insight into settler households. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. Okay. I'm just looking over our list of questions here. Um, I think you've addressed all of these. There's one question uh, about speaking to the process of working with emerging critic fellows as contrasted with more established reviewers, but I think you've already gone into that. You, you touched on that um, a bit earlier in the conversation. Is there anything you'd like to add on that point? No, just that we really try and uh, work with writers as they wish to be worked with. You know, there are some writers who love sending early draft material to editors and getting other eyes on that and, you know, sending something that is not finished uh, so that other people can kind of look at it while the seams are very loose and, you know, the hems haven't been pinned. Um, for other writers, that is like the, the last thing that they would ever, ever, ever want to do and makes them break out in a sweat. So really, you know, we, we try and be um, adapt to, to what our contributors are telling us they want and need. Right, right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to thank everyone, but first I'd just like to remind audience members that um, we'll be sending out a post-event survey, which you're welcome to complete. So please look out for that uh, via your email and that's the last thing that I need to tell everyone. So thank you to everyone for attending today. And especially thank you to Katrina so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us and for, you know, um, all the fabulous work that the Sydney Review of Books does uh, in supporting Australian literary culture. It's absolutely fantastic. And I encourage everyone, if you're watching and you, you haven't gone and, and read it, um, to, to check it out immediately. So thank you again, Katrina. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Writing New South Wales, for this space. And yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming. Cheers. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.